This story happened around four years ago. Back then, I was 18 and had just graduated high school. I decided to volunteer for a month in a southern Asian country before my university starts, since volunteering was something I always wanted to do. I managed to find a place to volunteer at and was supposed to live there for the first week with family friends. Then I'd start living at my workplace. Thing is, my workplace couldn't house me due to construction and having another female volunteer coming soon. So I had to find a hostel to stay at. And that's my biggest mistake. Also, my dumb ass wanting to smoke some weed too. I went on the internet and started looking for a hostel. Sure enough, I found one in the center of the city, in a relatively safe area. Also, the hostel had many great reviews from foreigners, so I thought it safe. I paid a visit to the hostel and was greeted by Jay. He was the nephew of the owner and was responsible for greeting foreigners and showing them around. Jin was in his mid-twenties, average looking dude, probably around five foot eight. I am six foot three, this will be important later. After I make the arrangements for me to stay there and agree to come the next day, he invites me to go with him on a walk to show me around the neighborhood, which I agree to. During our walk, he tells me about himself. He lived in the UK for a bit, tells me about his family, and asks if I smoke. Back then, I was a cool kid, fresh out of high school, so I ecstatically told him yes, since I was trying to get some weed, but didn't know how. He told me he can get it for me, and when I come tomorrow, he will have some for me. The next day I go to the hostel, and he tells me he couldn't get it. So I have to go with him and his friends, George, Tuk Tuk, to get in. In hindsight, that was a big red flag, but I was a dumb kid who really wanted to smoke, so I said yes. George looked like a cartoon villain. All his facial features were sharp and narrow. He had a little Van Dyke beard to go with it. Basically, a five foot six Jafar from Aladdin. I'll call him George. We all get in the tuk tuk and drove to the slums of the city to meet the dealer. Anyways, we get the weed and they tell me we are making a stop at George's house and smoking there for a bit. Fine by me. I had no reason to suspect them since they were nice and polite to me. We reach his house, still in the slums. It was a small room with a bed and three chairs. Nothing else. No tables or decor or anything. I sat on a chair, Jin sat on my right, and George sat on the bed rolling out some joints for us. We start smoking and talking. They started asking me about why I'm here how old I am, and stuff like that. Suddenly, it started becoming a bit too personal, asking me what my parents do for a living, how much they make, and the one that really caught my attention. Who are the people you live with, the family friend, and do they know where you are, and are they going to worry about you if you don't call soon or something? I was stoned then, but... The moment they said that, I started sobering up and realizing that I'm in a messed up situation. I told them that I'm supposed to call them in a few hours and that they knew which hostel I was staying at. Suddenly, another guy came and just stood at the doorway, completely blocking it. He was my height, but much bigger in size than me. I was trapped between them and 
had nowhere to go. Luckily, they couldn't do anything to me yet, since I told them I was supposed to make a phone call to the family friends. Starting to get nervous, I tell them that I'm too baked and can't even move or smoke, so kept passing up my turn to smoke. I just lay there, acting as if I'm high off my mind. They started speaking in the language, but it was clear to me they were speaking about me. Jin told them about the electronics I had and that I paid my full stay in cash. Now George, God bless his soul, thought I wasn't aware of my surroundings. So in perfect English, Jin told me he doesn't speak English, started mocking me, kept saying nice phone and asking me if I know how to swim. I looked at him and smiled and told him it's time to go because I was tired. We walked out and I told them I needed to go to the market real fast and if they needed anything. They kept telling me that they'll get me whatever I wanted themselves, but I insisted that I wanted to go and that they should send one of them with me. They sent the big guy. Now, the market was across the street from a bus station, and the buses don't stop at the station, they just slow down and you hop in and hop out. So, now was my chance. I waited until I saw a bus approaching, sprinting like my life depended on it. It did, and hopped in. They were screaming at me to come back, and started running after the bus. The moment the bus reached the neighborhood of the family friends, I just hopped out and walked around the neighborhood until morning came. Morning, I went to work and told them that a tuk-tuk tried to kidnap me, minus the weird part, so they escorted me to the hostel where I took my belongings and work allowed me to stay with them. When I told my family friends about what happened, they told me it's a common scam here and that they were planning to steal my belongings and dump me in the river when we left the house. That's why they asked if I knew how to swim and if someone was expecting me. So Jin and George, let's never meet again. This happened in the summer of 2010, when I was just entering my teenage years. My family took a trip to a really nice hotel in the city. I can't really remember why we decided to take the trip, but I remember a lot of family friends coming along with and staying in adjacent rooms. I've never asked my parents and it's not really important to the story. To preface, I'm a bit of a scaredy cat and always have been. I'm a pretty skinny, fragile kid, so I get spooked pretty easily, even now. This, however, was almost definitely not me freaking myself out like I normally did. Looking back, I'm incredibly lucky I trusted my instincts. This hotel had a strange design to it. The lobby was actually on the fourth floor, not the bottom floor, which I found strange. To access the lobby, you had to use the elevator. There was no way for you to get into it from the stairs. This information would have been nice to know before everything happened, as you'll find out. The hotel was organized in a square shape. Every floor was lined with a balcony, and you could look down into the lobby and cafe area from your floor. Essentially, if you were walking to your room, you could be seen from anyone that was on your floor if they just stepped out of the room and looked around. 
I was always afraid I'd fall over the balcony and sail down eight stories to my death. But they were high enough to a point where I wasn't too concerned for my safety. The first day or two was nice. My friends and I hung out and played cards all day. Or we watched whatever was on TV. At night, we'd explore the halls of the hotel and tell each other ghost stories. It was a really fun time, even though I didn't fully understand why we were there. On the third day, though, things got strange fast. I woke up to the sound of screaming coming from outside my door. Now, because of the hotel's design I mentioned, sounds from the lobby would echo all the way up to the top of the building. So when I walked outside to investigate, I immediately looked over the balcony to see what the commotion was about. I saw a girl laying on the ground, eggs and milk splattered everywhere around her. People were rushing to help her, and I heard a couple of people telling each other to call 911. It seemed like the girl was unconscious. Maybe she had just passed out or something. I scanned the lobby and saw that my family and a couple of my friends were in the lobby getting breakfast, all staring at the event in front of them. I decided I'd rush down to meet them to find out what happened. The elevator was on the opposite side of my floor, so I took the stairwell located right next to my room. We were on the 7th or 8th floor, so I knew I only had to take about 4 flights down. Not a big deal. I descended for a little while, looking for the number 4 on the wall, or the letter L. I passed floor 5, ready to find a door to the lobby. I took about 2 more flights of steps, before realizing that there hadn't been a door for the fourth floor. Nor had there been a door for the third or second. Now, at this point, I probably should have turned back. But I continued down because I was tired and didn't want to climb back up. There were some weird side hallways that went into pitch black areas with a bunch of piping and wiring. And though I was curious to explore, I passed them by. I quickly hit the bottom floor, a dimly lit and cold room with cinder block walls and concrete floors. In front of me was a set of double doors. I hesitated at first, but I assumed that this was just another way back to the lobby, so I opened them and entered. Behind the doors was a massive warehouse type room, probably the size of a smaller basketball stadium. The only light coming in was from the stairwell behind me, so I really wasn't able to see much. Stairs were stacked and covered in plastic wrap. Tables lined the wall, and in the distance, I thought I could see boxes stacked and lined against the wall as well. It was probably the storage room for the hotel. I looked around and saw an elevator in the back room, so I made my way towards it. I closed the door to the stairwell and began to walk in the dim light. The room was super muggy and dusty and it seemed like nobody had been down there in a long time. As I got closer to the elevator, I noticed it was a little bigger than the elevators in the lobby or the other floors. I pressed the up button, but got no response. There was a card swiper next to the button. Must have been for employees only, I thought. I turned back toward the stairwell doors 
making my way past the chairs and tables along the wall. When I got to the door, I gave it a tug. Locked. Of course. This is when things started to hit me, and I realized I was stuck in the dark, dusty basement of a hotel. I didn't have a phone, because my parents wouldn't let me get one until I graduated middle school, so I couldn't call anyone. Everyone likely assumed I was still asleep in my room, so I began to freak out, believing that nobody was going to look for me. I searched around the warehouse, looking for other ways out. Some areas of the place were better lit than the others, so I looked around in the areas I could see first, before starting on the darker side of the room. There was one other set of doors that I found, but it happened to be locked as well. I began to cry, scared that nobody would ever find me in this basement. I swear it felt like hours, but I think only a handful of minutes passed before I heard the door creak open. It wasn't the door from the stairwell, rather, the second door I had found. A slim, middle-aged man in the lab coat came out of the doors. Now, if this was 21-year-old me seeing this man, I would be very confused as to why this guy was wearing a lab coat in a hotel. I was only 12 or 13 at the time, so I immediately was relieved at the sight of an adult who looked smart. I approached him, tears in my eyes, and he immediately looked surprised to see me, as you'd expect. What are you doing down here? he yelled. I got lost on my way down to the lobby, and I've been locked in here. Do you have a key? I was shaking, eager to get out of there. He didn't answer my key question, and instead he said, I know a way out of here, follow me. He began to walk toward the doors with the stairwell, and I followed, relieved that someone had finally come to save me. We approached the doors and I began to reach for the handle, but he continued walking, isn't it right here? I asked him. I will never forget the look on his face when I said that. He looked nervous, and though it was dim, I could see sweat glistening from his forehead and behind his glasses. No, this way, he said sternly. I continued to follow him, but I was now nervous myself. We had passed the door to the stairs and were now headed toward a darker side of the basement, away from the elevators. He looked like he had no clue where he was leading me, as he kept checking around him, almost as if he was taking in his surroundings for the first time. We turned a corner and began walking toward the boxes, a dead end. I immediately froze realizing that something was very, very wrong. This guy had no idea where he was going, nor did he appear to work at the hotel. I said, my voice shaking, Okay, where are we going? He turned around and said, This way, just follow me. I knew that there were no doors by those boxes. I had checked there first after I found out the stairwell door was locked. I want to thank whatever God is up there for gifting me the idea I had next. I started yelling as loud as I could. I yelled so loud I gave myself a headache. The man, irritated and plugging his ears, began yelling back at me. What are you doing? Be quiet. I continued to yell. 
I don't even remember how long I was yelling. Finally, the man snapped and began quickly walking towards me. I went in a full sprint towards the stairwell doors, hoping to God they'd somehow magically be open. He didn't run after me. He walked sternly behind me, muttering things like, stupid fucker, and other kind of compliments. I was about five feet from the door when somebody burst through. My savior, a hotel janitor, who had heard the screaming from the stairwell. He saw the situation. Me, and some random guy in a lab coat in a locked basement and immediately told me to get behind him. The janitor asked me who the man was. I said I had no idea that he had come in through the door on the other side of the room, and I pointed to the door. The janitor quickly radioed into the desk that he had found a child in the basement, and quietly, so that I wouldn't hear. He said, this man came from outside, get security, or something like that. The man in the lab coat started trying to argue with the janitor, claiming that he simply was looking for a bathroom. The janitor clearly wasn't buying it, and kept saying things like, wait till security gets here and talk to them about it. I was standing beside him the whole time trying to take in what was happening, confused, out of my mind. Eventually, an employee from the front desk arrived and took me back up the steps to the lobby, where I met with my family, who surprisingly had no idea I was missing. I told them the story, crying and shaking, and they hugged me tightly, thanking the employee over and over again for their help. I never got to thank the janitor though. Looking back now, I have absolutely no clue what that man was doing in the basement. I don't have any information as to what happened afterwards, or who he was. I know for a fact that the incident with the girl in the lobby was unrelated. Something about low blood sugar, not sure. I've thought about that day a lot and the only explanation I could put together is that the door I found in the basement leads to the streets of the city where he must have wandered in from. I have no clue what his intentions were, why he was wearing a lab coat, or why he chose to pretend to know a way out. To be frank, this could have just been a huge misunderstanding of some sort, and I just chose a really bad time to get lost. But all I know for sure is if I hadn't screamed my lungs out, I might not be telling this story the same way, or at all. So, strange man in a lab coat, wandering around a dark, dusty hotel basement, let's not meet. The hotel I worked at was small, only 53 rooms in the entire place, and it's located next to downtown in a town in central Minnesota. As a night audit, you work by yourself, with the shift being from 11pm to 7am. You don't get many people checking into the hotel at night, one to three at most. The first duty as the night on it was to lock the doors so only guests could get in with their key. There is also a phone on the wall next to the main entrance in case someone arrives after the doors are locked or somebody orders a pizza, what have you. There is a front door in the lobby, a back door in the lobby, and two side doors. I proceeded to lock all of the doors and head into the back room, behind the front desk to do laundry. As there is no staff on hand to do laundry, another task for the night audit, 
is to finish any remaining laundry that wasn't finished during the day. There is a cordless phone you can bring with you when going into the back or around the other parts of the hotel. We had no more scheduled check-ins that night, but there was a couple of rooms available. I heard somebody try and open the front door, was unsuccessful, and left. Moments later, the phone rang, and when I answered, the other person did not talk right away. I walked up to the front desk, and the other person finally started talking. They went on a spiel saying they were a former cop, and something about having court in the morning, and that if they weren't let in, they were going to come in and shoot me, and that they were circling the hotel. There are windows that look out to the front of the hotel that are visible from the computer I had walked to during the phone call. I told them I was sorry, we didn't have any rooms available, and they hung up before I even finished my sentence. I looked out the window, and there was a person standing across the street, staring back at me with a phone in their hand. At this point, I'm really freaking out, and I go to all the doors and double check that they were all locked. It was a good thing I checked, because one of the side doors had been propped open with a doorstop. Obviously, I shut the door and proceeded to go to a conference room with the side of where the person was standing. I kept the lights off, and I peeked through the blinds, but the person was gone. I was pretty freaked out for the rest of the night, because there are windows pretty much everywhere in this hotel. So if this person was watching me, they would be able to all night if they pleased. So, the person who threatened to shoot me while I was working, let's not meet. I was born and raised in Texas, but had moved to New York when I was 21. So when I found out at the beginning of a week-long trip that I'd have a couple of overnights in Austin, I was super excited to go to my home state for a few days. My brother lived just north of the city, and we planned to hang out and go to dinner the night I arrived when he got off work. And the following day, we were going to meet up with our dad, who lived about an hour away. So I get to the hotel downtown. The crew and I checked in. And then, we each head off to our rooms. A short elevator ride, and I get to mine. Where not even five minutes later, there's a loud, hard knock on the door. It was only around 1 or 2 p.m., and I hadn't called either my dad or my brother to let them know I was in town yet, so they wouldn't know what room. I assumed it was maybe one of my crewmates, so I headed to the door. Before even making it to the door, however, a loud, male voice on the other side boomed. The front desk sent me about the bathroom problem you called in, before trying to open the door. Unlock the door and open up, miss. I need in now. I froze in my tracks. I hadn't even been to the bathroom yet, let alone called anything to the front desk. I'm a petite chick, and I will take no shit from anyone, despite my size. I still err on the side of caution, slowly inching toward the door to look out at the peephole. All I could tell was the man on the other side was at least six foot tall and easily over double my weight. No way in hell I was going to unlock that door, and I responded to the guy, telling him he must have had the wrong room. He continued pounding on the door while constantly turning the handle, telling me no, he needed in and was getting in the room one way or another. I panicked, but thankfully had the sense to grab the phone and call the front desk. The concierge confirmed that they had neither sent anyone up to my room, nor 
and they received a call about the bathroom. The entire time, this guy was still determined to get in my room, pounding and yelling. Lucky for me, the front desk had dispatched security to my floor. When the security officers step off the elevator a few seconds later, and I can hear them in the hall approach and ask the guy who he was, what he was doing, and telling him he needed to leave the hotel. He immediately gets hostile and aggressive towards them. And the front desk clerk I'm still on the phone with tells me police have been called and are on their way. In the meantime, I'm trapped in my room, scared shitless. Long story short, the cops show up pretty quickly and manage to arrest the guy for trespassing and criminal menacing or some shit. I later found out that the guy was also wanted in connection to a string of break-ins and violent sexual assaults in Austin. He had seen and stalked me for a while from the minute I entered the lobby. Apparently, I was exactly his type of victim. Nothing else happened after that, but it still rattled me the entire stay in the hotel. This happened February 14th, Valentine's Day. Me and two of my friends decided we would get a cheap hotel room and they would take some LSD to kick off the loneliest holiday ever. I've done it before, but was not in a good mindset to take it that night, so I settled for a bottle of wine. Anyway, we weren't familiar with the area of the hotel that we booked the room at, but it was cheap and that's all that mattered to us. It was around three in the morning, and outside the door, we hear someone stumbling around and bumping into the walls. But it was Valentine's Day anyway, so we brushed it off as a drunk couple going to get it on. The stumbling stops outside our door, and it just got silent. My friends are tripping at this point, and I'm pretty drunk. We hear this woman start sobbing outside our door, and I'm assuming she sat down with her back on our door, because we heard her slide down the wall and collapse right on the other side of the door. The woman starts trying to speak to us through the cracks of the door outline, saying she has lost her dog and was wondering if we could help her. It was 3 a.m. and we didn't know shit about the area, so common sense would say don't respond, so we didn't. The woman then proceeds to bang on the door saying we stole her dogs and she's gonna come in and murder us sluts. She was scratching and banging on the door for 10 minutes straight and then just stopped. My friends are starting to have a bad trip because of her but when she stopped I tried to reassure them she was gone and they can go back to having a good time. To prove it to my friends I checked through the peephole to verify that this woman was indeed gone. The bitch was trying to stare right back at me through the other side of the peephole. I watched her as she stepped back and stood there, as still and solid as a literal concrete statue. She had her eyes right on the peephole, staring right into my eye. I doubt she could see me through the peephole, but I was making dead eye contact with her. The woman then proceeds to start screaming and throw her body against the door, which thankfully woke up our neighbors, and they called the front desk. The woman behind the front desk comes and tries to get this woman to leave. The woman left. 
but was going down the walkways of the hotel, being loud and not leaving the property. She's still crying out for her lost dogs in the hotel hallway at 3 a.m. They said they never saw her leave and implied that she's still inside. So they just told me to keep an eye out for her and to call the front desk if anything else happens. The police stayed posted outside the hotel for about an extra 30 minutes, then left. Turns out, the bitch was just on crack. But still, hearing this woman throw her body onto the door, saying she would kill us, was traumatizing enough. We left early that morning and never went back. Thanks to this woman for killing my friend's trips and my drunkenness. Hey guys, thanks for listening to the video. I hope you've enjoyed it. So go ahead and leave a like. Go on and give me a comment too. Let me know which story you like the most. And for first timers to my channel, go ahead and hit the subscribe button. Turn on the notifications too, so you won't miss out on any of my videos. I've just set up a Twitter as well. So if you do fancy getting regular updates, go ahead and follow me. All the links are in the description. I'm quite proud of what we're doing in this channel, guys. You've all been supportive and positive. And honestly, I couldn't have done it without each and every one of you. So thank you very much, guys. So I'll see you in the next video. Catch you later, guys.